Our guest today is Dr. Saeed Hossein Nasser. He's university professor of Islamic studies at George Washington University. Dr. Nasser is a world-renowned scholar of Islamic and religious studies and author of over 500 articles and 50 books, including The Heart of Islam. Dr. Nasser, good to sit and talk with you once again. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, but as we Muslims always begin everything, it's a wonderful thing to be able to talk to you again. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, I really am excited to talk to you because I think this is such an important time uh, for us to relearn or learn about Islam, huh? It certainly is. Uh, in a sense, one wishes that uh, nobody even bothered with this situation, but the situation is such that almost everything that occurs there's an Islamic element in the middle of it, and therefore there's a necessity, whether one likes it or not, to get to know more about the various facets of Islam, the very complicated situation within which it enters into various arenas, political, social, cultural, and otherwise, mm -hmm. religious, of course. It's a very, very important time, a difficult time in world history today. Uh, Islam, the word itself has a translation, doesn't it? Yes, it means submission to God. It's, uh, Arabic roots usually have several meanings that cluster together, fields of meaning. And uh, SLM, from which comes the word Islam, you know, all Arabic words are made of roots of usually three or four letters, usually three letters, also means peace. So it really means both surrender to God and the peace that comes from it. Ah, so, so the surrendering is, uh, brings about the peace? Exactly. Wow. Yes. yes. Um, you know what that reminds me of? It's, 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 it reminds me of Buddhism in a way, to accept that there is uh, imperfection and suffering in the world, and, and part of it is to accept the reality of what's going on. Uh, I would, of course, but also other religions, because ultimately to submit oneself to the supreme reality brings with it peace. Whether one is Christian, Jewish, is Muslim, or anything else, Buddhist, Hindu, anything. Ah. But it's expressed in different ways, but in Islam it's especially emphasized. So the cent is a very central reality uh, that uh, to have a submission is always peace. I, is that what is at, at the heart of Islam, this idea of submission and peace? Yes, that's why the name of the religion is what it is. And moreover, in the Quran, not only Islam, as you and I talk about now, that is the religion of a billion and a half people today, mm. but all religions are called Islam, ultimately. All religions are called submission to God. Yeah. And Abraham and Christ are also called Muslim. Uh -uh. They're called Muslim in the Quran. Huh. It's not only the Prophet of Islam was Muslim or I am a Muslim, but these two very great figures of the pre-Islamic religious history of humanity are called Muslim also. And so Islam has an even more generic meaning. It means the universal submission to God. Mm. From the time that God created humanity to today, whoever submits to God is in a sense a Muslim. <laughs> is, um, is, is there a thought in, let me ask you this question. Is there a recurring theme in the Quran? I would, yes, but I would say more than one recurring theme. I think the major recurring theme is the continuous reassertion of the unity of God, the rejection of every other divinity, every other thing taken for divinity. Not every other divinity, there is no other divinity from an Islamic point of view, but all the different idols that human beings take for divinity, even those which they do not call divine in the religious sense, but we have a lot of idols that we carry with us, mm. idols of our desires, of our ideas, of our the ideologies, this and that, and the major theme of the Quran is the return to the oneness of God, as absolute power, transcendence, will, love, goodness, all the qualities that go with it. You mentioned idols, and I was thinking of, uh, in my uh, reading, uh, 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 prior to uh, our conversation, uh, Muhammad, uh, as the prophet, goes back to 570, is it? 570? He was born in 570, died in 623. Uh, so, uh, in that era, uh, there was a lot of worship of idols? Depends where you were in the world. Uh -huh. uh, Arabia had been left outside of the grand currents of religion in the Mediterranean world. Although there were some Jews and Christians in Arabia, in fact, the Quran alludes to it, the prophets' sayings alludes to it, 
we know by external history. But uh, by and large, Arabia itself had remained in the condition of ancient forms of idolatry. And when we talk about Arabia, just paint the picture. What are the countries we're talking about? There's today? A, actually, there's a, uh, Arabia means the Arabian Peninsula. Okay. Uh, today we call the Arab world those who speak Arabic. Uh, but uh, it meant actually from today, uh, southern Jordan and Iraq to the Persian Gulf and the Gulf of Oman, that is including uh, these small emirates in the south, Oman, Yemen, Saudi Arabia. So in so this area, Arabia. yeah, in this area, why did, um, why did uh, Islam kind of catch on in that area? Uh, from a sort of theological point of view, of course, uh, God never reveals a religion except to a place where he wants to reveal it. <laughs> Why was Christ born in Bethlehem and not in Benares? Ah. You, know, you could ask this question. Why was Moses not in China but in uh, <laughs> Palestine to Mount Sinai? Uh, why did he go to Egypt, not to Ethiopia? These are, of course, beyond the can of human understanding for those who believe in God and his will. But if you look at it from the human point of view, this was a very untouched area of human collectivity. And in a sense, something of uh, the, all there was idolatry, lack of excessive cerebralization and sophistication that had come about in the Mediterranean world and encountered with Greek philosophy and mm -hmm. a lot of rationalism, skepticism, nihilism. Uh, you didn't have things like that in Arabia. It was, it was sort of simple Bedouin people they had certain noble characters, but they were, from the religious point of view, idolaters. That's why they, in Arabic, this period is called the Age of Ignorance, Jahiliya. Ah. That is, they were ignorant of the nature of reality, of ultimate reality, of the one God. Although among them, there were some who worshipped the one God, including the Prophet of Islam. The Hold Prophet on that note for just a sec. I tell the folks at home, we're talking with uh, Dr. Syed Nasser. He is a university professor of Islamic studies at George Washington University, and I must say, uh, I know this to be true, he is one of the foremost experts on Islam uh, in America today and respected all over the world, so you want to listen very, very carefully. Sit tight. This is America and the World. This is America is made possible by the National Education Association, the nation's largest advocate for children and public education. Poonsan Corporation, forging a higher global standard. The CTC Foundation, AFO Communications, and the Rotondaro Family Trust. Uh, let me backtrack and uh, educate me. When I say uh, Dr. Uh, Syed Nasser, uh, to include Hussein, is, is it Hussein? Yes, it's actually, important. Hussein is my first name. Sayed is an honorific name, ah. which is a descendant of the Prophet of Islam. So well, all the members of our family, for example, are called Sayed. Ah, so it, the pronunciation is Sayed, right? In Persian. It's Sayed in Arabic, Sayed in Persian. Ah, but, and but 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 the first name is important. Yes, Hossein is my first name. Hossein. Yes. Ah, oh, thank you. I'll call you doctor as well. <laughs> uh, in uh, Islam, there's no picture of God, is there? No. Uh, it's, in this sense, Islam and Judaism have the same perspective on divinity. Thou shalt not make a graven image. One of the Ten Commandments revealed to Moses is very much respected also in Islam. One cannot make an image of God because to, Im to make an image is to limit. You cannot have an image without limitation of lines or colors or forms or curves and so forth. And God is beyond all limitation. So in prayer in the mosque, uh, is there a sense, or at home, wherever one is praying, a sense of um, a feeling or of, uh, of an intellectual concept? It's all, all of those. First of all, it's a presence. A presence. presence. And then a feeling, and then an intellectual concept. Sometimes, a light, a warmth, you know, uh, for uh, elements of nature which are symbolic of spiritual realities. Let me give you an example. Uh, in the Pro Protestantism, rejected also pictures of God. In the 
in Protestant churches, uh, especially Lutheran churches, you don't have pictures of God. Right. So when a young boy prays to God, uh, he, uh, it's not that like, he has a statue of God in front of him like a Hindu boy would uh, pray to Ganesh or something yes. like that. So it's, I would not like to call it abstract because it's more than abstract. It's concrete, but it's not in the physical world. It's a reality which God allows us to experience without visual form. So when you're in the mosque or praying, uh, do you actually feel a God's presence? Very much so. Wow. Feel, wow. Very, very much so. You wow. feel standing in a sacred space before God's presence mm. because God sees us. Um, they have a feeling uh, that although we do not see him because he has no form, but we have form and God sees us. Uh -huh. so, so, for example, the power of vision. Now, we associated vision from our point of view with the two eyes, with the form of the eyes. Mm -hmm. But God sees without having physical eyes. Mm -hmm. So the Muslim is aware of these qualities which our human form reflects, but without the human form when it comes to the divinity. How do you come by the existence of God? How do you prove that to yourself? Uh, what is the word you in your sentence? Do you mean myself yeah. or is Muslim? Yeah. Uh, for me, ever since childhood, uh, the reality of God was evident. It was first of all experiential. I used to experience God in my life. And although I went to MIT and Harvard mm -hmm. and studied Western philosophy to, and all, every atheistic philosopher you can imagine, from Jean Paul Sartre to Bertrand Russell and so forth, that uh, certitude of God's reality never left my soul. But there are, uh, in Islam, instruction also for, for those who are not certain to, to think, to yearn, to intellect, to use their intellect, of course, to see the signs uh, of God's wisdom in creation, much of it like you have in the wisdom tradition of, of the West, to, for a person of vision, uh, the sign of everything, a fly flying uh, in the air, a mosquito, uh, an ant walking, walking on the ground is proof of God's existence mm. in the deepest sense because of the wonder of creation. Everything is so wondrous. Our educational system is very successful in destroying the sense of wonder. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ooh. Uh, that's sorry. a whole other program. <laughs> exactly. I, I, in the sense that I'm yeah. saying. Yes. Where, for example, we think we, in science we explain, but we, don't, we explain a way so it's no longer, it's a wonder, but it's still a wonder that a butterfly flies. Yes. No matter how much I talk about the aerodynamics and the wing and so forth, and <laughs> it doesn't exhaust that sense of wonder. Now, in our educational system, in the Islamic world, the sense of wonder was always cultivated. And so from my childhood, when I had this sense of wonder and sort of walking, playing in the garden, I felt the God's presence, the sense of wonder was not destroyed by the fact that I studied years and years of science and I mm -hmm. got a degree in physics and mathematics and things like that later on. That always remained with me. Mm. You say uh, about 1.5 billion uh, followers of uh, Islam, Muslims, right? That's, That's the, right. the word. Yes. Um, how, about how many in the United States? Do we know? I'm um, very surprised. What, uh, for years and years, in the 1980s and 1990s, the figure that was given was about 6 million. And that's how the Muslims had counted it also, between 6 and 7 million. Then a new statistics came out by Pew or something like that, only 2.3 million Muslims in America, which I think is totally false. Mm. So I don't know on what basis they did the calculation. How about you and I settling on five? No, I think it's, it's the six, seven million. Oh, six definitely seven. correct. Okay. You see, there are, uh, of course, it depends on how you define a Muslim, but you say there are two billion Christians. You include 50 million Christians in France, but 40% are atheists. <laughs> they're included by the Catholic Church as the billion Muslim, uh, Catholics in the world. We won't, we won't get hung up on the statistics. So there are Muslims, for example, who don't practice. Yes. There are very few Muslims who have become atheists. They're extremely mm. rare in Islam, much rarer than in Christianity and Judaism. But there are very, very few. But there are many who are lax in their practice. Now, do we call them a Muslim or not? Are we, do, are we only including people who go to mosques or not, mm -hmm. for example? So it's, in that sense, it's nebulous. But just in the Washington area, we have several hundred thousand Muslims. In mm. the New York area, we have over a million Muslims. There's no doubt about it. I know that from knowledge of the mosques and, and leaders of, of Islamic communities and things like that. In the Los Angeles area, 
they're easily over a million and a half in the greater Los Angeles, Orange County and Los Angeles uh -huh. County. Uh, Muslim, add this all together, it's uh, very soon it's going to be much, much more than a, a two, three million. I think it's around six, seven million people. Um, perception, reality, or myth, uh, there is a war against Islam? Uh, all three. All three are true at the same time. That is, uh, d certain people in the West are trying to carry out a war against Islamic religion. In the old days, when this was not politically important, the people were carrying out the war with Christian missionaries. They had money from uh, rich people in the United States. They would go to the Islamic world and they would preach against Islam. They were, in the sense, they were carrying a war against it, but not with guns, mm. by opening up schools and hospitals and injections and trying to have people lose their faith and become Christians. What was their goal? What, 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 why did they feel that they had to do that? Well, you know, this is a, a character of Christianity that Christ said, go and preach unto the nations. And so many Christians felt it was part of the Christian duty. Christianity is a very missionary religion. Mm -hmm. And when it became, although it became itself weakened, but still remained a religion of a wealthy civilization, it began to a missionary activity much more extensively. In the Middle Ages, when Europe was much more Christian than in the modern period, there were very few Christian missionaries. In mm -hmm. the modern period, when uh, France was producing Voltaire and people like that, it was supporting missionary activity in North Africa because of also political influence that the Catholics could bring to it for mm -hmm. it in Algeria. Mm -hmm. You have all kinds of very strange things that take place. But uh, in modern times, I'm talking another, about another kind of war. That is, uh, some people feel that uh, Islam is a threat to the West, which is absurd because it's the West that is occupied by several Islamic countries. I know of no Western country occupied and invaded by an Islamic country. If you know one, let me know. It's always the other way around, but the, is, the situation is crazy. This is a fearful situation. We better put these people down before they come and take over us. Mm. So there is, there are elements within American society, more than in Western Europe, but also in Western Europe, in some countries like England and Holland and so forth, and a few in France who would like to carry out actually a physical war against Islam and, ca and conquer it and destroy its power. Uh, but there, that's not true of the whole of the West. When this uh, uh, film came out and uh, there were these uh, riots in the different countries and people being killed and things like that, um, clearly to uh, insult someone else's religion uh, is uh, is horrific unto itself, you know. But part of the deal in the United States is crazy people to get to say or do whatever they want uh, under the heading of, of free speech. How, how how can we when when all this happened? What was your reaction? I will be very frank with you. Yes. And I live in this country. I know this country well. Mm -hmm. Of course, freedom of speech is a very respected right in this country, but it's not absolute. If you go to a Washington cinema in the middle, it starts saying fire, fire, and there's a stampede and two people get killed, mm -hmm. you're going to be imprisoned. Mm -hmm. uh, so a, or on a more practical level, supposing this poster hate speech in New York calling uh, Muslim savages, calling the Arab savages, supposing this were done against the Jews, God forbid, would that ever be allowed? No. Well, I was would, uh, it would not be allowed because some people have tried it the, mm -hmm. and the freedom of speech uh, stops someplace, mm -hmm. automatically stops someplace. So it's not a, a complete freedom of speech. But even if we do accept that freedom of speech, another issue which is very, very sensitive and very tragic and sad, I don't care about those atheists in France who have no religion and who want to destroy what remains of religion as a kind of inner urge which many atheists have, I, from Marxists to other kinds of atheists. I'm not talking about that. But to have Christians burn the Quran mm -hmm. or take joy in destroying the person of the prophet, mm -hmm. what happened to Christian charity? Mm -hmm. What happened that Christ taught people not to hurt other people? Put aside mm -hmm. everything else. That by my act of singing the national anthem of Bolivia, I'm causing pain to a thousand people, supposedly here in the street. Yeah. Why should I do that? What happened to human compassion? Mm -hmm. What happened to love? And then the third point, which is most important of all, 
which no one brought up in all these debates on the media, as far as I could see, I don't have time to see everything. Uh, that's the following. There was a day in the history of the West when if you offended not only Christ, but even the Pope, you'd be guillotined or hanged or burned at the stake in two minutes. Mm. Mm -hmm. The time when the sacred was the most important thing in Western civilization. Then the West decided to take another path. It had its own freedom. Nobody coerced it. Hundred year war that occurred between Catholic and Protestant. They both decided to marginalize religion somewhat. And they said human rights are more important than divine rights. We don't talk about divine rights anymore. God will take care of his own divine rights. We take care of human rights. So in the streets of Washington, if you curse at God or Christ, nobody cares. But if you offend someone walking down the street or give hate speech, you go to prison. Mm -hmm. This is the truth of the matter. Now, so far, so far so good. Every civilization, every society should have the right to decide what course to take. But now the next step is what is really not acceptable. People in the West who say, why are Muslims offended? Mm -hmm. Are following, by the logic of things, a purely colonial attitude saying whatever we do is right. And since we decided to put God aside and make human, humans the center of existence and be imprison people for offending human beings but not for God, what right do you have not to do the same? You must do the same thing. Mm -hmm. If you don't do the same thing, if you get, still get angry, you're backwards, savages, medieval, all the things that were even said in the United Nations recently by some people against the Islamic world. Let me ask this question, and I hear what you're saying. Uh, if um, if the rule should be respect uh, and and tolerance uh, for us uh, respecting the religion of uh, Islam and realizing the sensitivity is is there uh, and that the two cultures may not uh, the the two cultures may clash yes. on this on this yes. on this point. Uh, do we not have a, a, a right to expect that when someone does something and steps out of line and does one of these horrific films or uh, speeches or whatever, that on the other side of the, uh, of, the, of the oceans, that those countries will be angry, uh, call us to task, if it's us or any Western culture, but not explode into riots and killing. Is, is that not a reasonable expectation? No. Please tell me why. I'll tell you. Uh, when emotions arise, you cannot, a foreign country cannot set limits on exactly on emotions of people in another country. Uh. How many hooligans have killed people after soccer rights in England. Could Pakistan set a limit for excitement in football matches, but don't go beyond, <laughs> yeah, beyond yeah. that? That's absurd. Uh -huh. well, because, because religion is strong. People have great love for the prophet. And it's not personal. If, if they, somebody cursed at them, they won't, and you said you should not so, angry. So, that's so, a religious so, matter. So, so, so doctor, uh, uh, this is crucial for our conversation. Uh, what you're saying is that uh, it's so uh, important to uh, a, a Muslim, uh, this concept of God and uh, respect. And the holiness of the prophet, and, and, and all respect, prophets. Yes, uh, that, uh, that no matter how you slice and dice it, it's unacceptable and uh, will it, continue to that's be. That's right. It's, it's going to cause pain. And for most people, the pain is not expressed in the streets. That's why if Cairo has 50 million people, 200,000 come in the street. The other 40 million also suffer. Ah. It isn't that everybody, but the pain but, is... But, but, is, but that's is just going to happen again. I know. I know. I know. That's a very, very unfortunate thing. Of course, I always give advice to Muslims. Everybody gives advice to Muslims. Uh, that every time they do this, you're killing yourself. You know, uh, gives, gives, the, gives self. the religion it's a bad name? Uh, not, no, give, no, that, that doesn't, doesn't no? matter because religion doesn't receive a bad name in this way. It receives a bad name by being insulted. And, uh, the person who makes pornographic films of Christ yeah, yeah, is doing yeah. a lot more against religion than a person, that some ignorant person in Georgia who may uh, do some strange thing that fundamentalists may do that you in New England or here think to be crazy. 
That's not, that's not the point. The point is much more uh, profound than that. The point is that uh, in the state of the Islamic world today, where faith is still very strong, where in contrast to France, where only 10 to 11 percent of people go to church, and England, where only 6 percent go to church, 95 percent of people in Cairo go to Friday prayers. We're not, whether we like it or not, this is a situation in the world. I mean, in that situation, to insult openly the sacred, what is sacred to that society, in the name of I'm free, I can do whatever I want, mm -hmm. that is not going to have, go be without consequences. Doctor, thank you for the education once My again. My great pleasure. My thank great you. pleasure. God thank be you. with you. God thank you. To see you. Thank you. For information about my new book, The Chance of a Lifetime, and online video for all This Is America programs, visit our website, thisisamerica.net. And now you can follow us on Facebook. This Is America is made possible by the National Education Association, the nation's largest advocate for children and public education. Poonsan Corporation, forging a higher global standard. The CTC Foundation, AFO Communications, and the Rotondaro Family Trust.